Hello, this is Dr. James Camp at Lee College in Baytown, Texas, and this is my lecture on the life cycle of blood. We're going to be talking about the locations of hematopoiesis, the hematopoietic stem cell, the basic process of erythropoiesis, and the whole life cycle of an erythrocyte and its regulation through erythropoietin. We're going to talk about the basic process of leukopoiesis and the basic process of thrombopoiesis. Okay. So there's some uh, disagreement over whether what we're talking about today should be called hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. Uh, it's two different interpretations of the same Greek root, but um, hematopoiesis is the more general term, which includes uh, fetal blood formation, whereas hemopoiesis seems to uh, apply mostly to the adult, which is what we're going to be talking about today, so I guess that's fine. So all discussions of hemopoiesis uh, end up coming down to a diagram that looks something like this. Um, some of your books may have this diagram. Uh, I think the book I'm actually teaching out of right now um, does not have everything lumped together into one nice master diagram like this, so uh, your mileage may vary. You, you may have to look up several different smaller diagrams in your book to understand this. Um, but the idea is that somewhere up here at the top is something called a hemocytoblast or hematopoietic stem cell. This is one of the uh, rarest cells in the human body. It is also one of the most valuable cells in the human body. If you can capture enough of these cells from a person's body, you can transplant them into another patient who needs a complete blood cell, a complete bone marrow transplant. You can transplant them back into the same person you took them from after you've done chemotherapy so that uh, any blood that they've lost, any blood forming capacity that they've lost through the chemotherapy or the radiotherapy or whatever can be reconstituted. Uh, someone who has uh, uh, leukemia, it's often the only possible transplant is to, uh, only possible treatment is to give them a lethal dose of radiation that will wipe out their entire bone marrow, including all the cancer cells, and then transplant their hemocytoblasts, which are presumably not cancerous, you know, back into their body. And um, so these are very valuable cells. The only problem is we have no idea what they look like. Uh, most cells in the body, we have some way of staining them, some way of marking them with particular uh, antibodies or other markers. Uh, there are cell decoration molecules called CD4 and CD8 and CD34 and CD38 and all of these things. Um, we have some way of identifying which cell we're talking about. Um, the hemocytoblast has not been identified um, with a unique marker profile, so there's no way to take a, a population of bone marrow and identify which ones are the stem cells. Um, so we have to just take a giant needle, stick it into somebody's bone marrow, and pull out as much bone marrow as we can, hoping that we get enough of these hemocytoblasts in there. Uh, we have ways of enriching them, of, of you know, taking out the mature cells and making sure that what we inject into the person is mostly stem cells, but we have no way of knowing how many stem cells are in there or whether it's enough for a transplant until we do the transplant and, and find out. Um, so if you want to get into uh, the big business of cell research, uh, try to find out how to identify uh, hemocytoblasts. That's a uh, holy grail of biomedical research. Okay, when one of these hemocytoblasts divides, okay, it divides into two cells, two daughter cells. One of them remains a hemocytoblast so that we always have the same number of, of stem cells, the other one has to make a decision. Is it going to become a lymphoid cell or a myeloid cell? Um, in the actual body, most of them become myeloid because we don't need that many lymphoid cells, but sometimes they will become lymphoid. Um, each one of these little uh, cells with multiple arrows coming out of it means that there's a decision point there, okay? 
and the cell has to decide when it divides which of those uh, lines it's going to go down. Once you get into one of these pathways here where all the arrows go in one direction, well, at that point, you've, you're have you what we call committed. Okay, you have to become, um, you know, an erythroid progenitor has to become a proerythroblast, has to become a normal blast, etc., uh, etc. Et um, a uh, granulocyte progenitor, on the other hand, has another decision to make. Does it become eosinic, basophilic, or neutrophilic? Uh, and if so, which which uh, which fill does it end up maturing into? Um, lymphoid stem cells are committed to becoming lymphocytes, but they too have a decision to make. They can become a natural killer. They can migrate to the thymus and become a T cell, or they can stay in the bone marrow and become a B cell. Okay, and um, we don't have all of these stages of maturation in the lymphoid lineage. We just kind of skip right on down to mature cells, but the difference is that these mature cells still retain the ability to divide and clone themselves to make more, uh, more lymphocytes, more natural killers. Okay. Now this is a sort of simplified breakdown of that diagram from the past previous uh, slide. Um, I'm going to put a version of this up on Dragnet for you all to uh, label. So I'm not going to fill this out for you right now. I'm just going to point out that um, it more or less mirrors the previous slide and uh, leave it at that. Okay, erythropoiesis specifically refers to the production of erythrocytes. And it is regulated by the hormone erythropoietin, or EPO. Uh, little known fact, but um, more erythrocyte progenitors are made in your bone marrow every day than you actually use. Uh, and so it depends on the level, the blood level of EPO, or erythropoietin, how many of those bone marrow progenitors uh, mature into actual red blood cells. So the way this works is that um, when you don't have enough red blood cells in your blood to carry all the oxygen that your blood needs, um, that decreased blood oxygen is detected by the kidney. The kidney releases EPO into the blood and those EPO molecules travel around your blood until they reach red bone marrow. Now, red bone marrow is found mostly in the flat bones of your body. So here in the, um, uh, in the flat part of your, your ileum uh, is a common place to look for red bone marrow, but also your sternum, your uh, shoulder blades, other flat bones, and also in the heads of your... Uh, humerus and your femur. Now the red bone marrow responds to EPO by producing more red blood cells and those red blood cells of course are going to travel through the lungs on their way back to the kidney. Okay so they're going to pick up more oxygen and when the kidney detects that more blood oxygen is available okay it's going to release less EPO, and so we, we end up in a negative feedback situation. Okay. Um, there's a complex series of events. A myeloid stem cell first becomes an erythroid progenitor known as a CFUE. Um, you see this terminology in uh, hematopoiesis a lot. CFU means colony forming unit, and that means if you were to spill all of your blood cells out onto a petri dish with the right kind of growth media for them you'd end up with a colony of erythrocyte forming cells here and a colony of myeloid cells here and a colony of lymphocyte cells here and so each of the cells that 
forms one of these colonies is a colony forming unit. Uh, progenitor cells form proerythroblasts and then erythroblasts. Normoblasts um, eject their nucleus to become reticulocytes, and reticulus begin to circulate in the blood. Uh, retics, as they're called in lab speak, um, should make up 1-2% to of circulating blood cells. More immature cells, a high retic count, could indicate leukemia. Okay, myeloid leukemia. Uh, less than 1 to 2% could indicate that you've got a problem with hemopoiesis, maybe not enough iron in your diet or not enough EPO being produced by your kidneys, and so you're, you're destined to become anemic. Okay, so what happens to these blood cells once they're out there? Well, as you know, red blood cells have no nucleus and no organelles, so they have no way to maintain themselves. Um, even so, they circulate for a fairly astounding 120 days before they're uh, looking sad and worn out like this blood cell here. Um, there are a huge number of macrophage in your spleen, um, slightly fewer but still plenty of them in your liver, who kind of feel up your red blood cells as they travel through those organs. And if the red blood cell is worn out, um, they will phagocytize it, gobble it up, and then take it apart for recycling. Now, the cellular components, the, the lipid bilayer, obviously can be reused by your body to make new cells. Uh, the protein parts, the globin, um, obviously can also be broken down into amino acids and... Um, recycled okay um, so we can recycle that um, the heme um, the iron um, is it turns out very difficult to keep in your body um, it, we try to store this in the, the liver so again we try to recycle this as much as possible um, but um, sometimes it just goes in the trash, uh, gets lost in body fluids like uh, sweat, uh, menses, when a woman is menstruating, she loses some amount of her iron, etc. Uh, but the heme is not recyclable, okay? So um, this has to be disposed of, uh, this has to go in the trash. Um, has to be disposed of carefully so that we don't toxic, we don't store toxic stuff in the body. Uh, so heme is converted in the liver into biliverdin, which is converted into bilirubin. Sorry, now heme in your in your spleen is converted to biliverdin and bilirubin. Bilirubin is converted by the liver into a substance that is secreted into the intestines. Okay, uh, so a frequent problem in babies, uh, neonates, is that their liver is not quite up to full function yet, and so bilirubin builds up in their blood. They have what's called bilirubinemia. Uh, that bilirubin is a, a bright yellow color, and it tends to turn their skin yellow, which is the reason that, that some babies are born jaundiced. Uh, really easy to treat. You put them under a particular color wavelength of, of light, uh, a couple of hours a day, uh, you know, a special lamp while they sleep, and it breaks down the bilirubin, um, and then eventually their liver catches up, and it's not a problem anymore. Okay, so let's summarize the life cycle of a red blood cell here. EPO is produced by the kidney in response to low blood oxygen. Okay, red blood cells are then produced by erythropoiesis in the red bone marrow. In fact, it's the erythrocytes that make the red bone marrow red. Erythroid progenitors become um, pro-erythroblasts and then 
erythroblasts, and then normoblasts, who finally eject their nucleus and become uh, reticulocytes. Those exit to the circulation, they last one to two days, and eventually become mature to full-fledged full erythrocytes. Those red blood cells circulate in the blood for about 120 days. And then the worn out red blood cells are phagocytized in the spleen, or if the spleen doesn't catch them, in the liver. People often ask, how can you live without a spleen? The answer is your liver will take up uh, the immunological and hematological functions of the spleen if you don't have one. Um, now, hemoglobin is separated into three components. Um, the globin protein is digested into amino acids, which are um, recycled. Okay. Um, the iron is stored in the liver to be recycled or is lost in feces, sweat, urine, or menses. Um, and then um, heme is converted into bilirubin, which is released by the liver as a component of bile into the small intestine. Bilirubin is converted first into urobilinogen. Okay, the uro means some of this is actually reabsorbed into the blood and secreted in the urine. It's what gives urine its yellow color. Um, then in the large intestine, most of the uh, bilirubin is converted into stercobilin, which is um, the major pigment of feces. It's what gives your feces its absolutely attractive uh, greenish brown color. Okay. Lastly, I want to talk briefly about thrombopoiesis because this follows a different track than most of the other poieses. Um, it begins in the red bone marrow with megakaryoblasts that form megakaryocytes under the influence of thrombopoietin or TPO, TPO for short. Um, TPO activates your megakaryocytes to stick out little um, proplatelets, little extensions of their cytoplasm here into the blood and as the blood flow goes past, it pinches off little tiny, you know, two micron fragments of, uh, of cell, uh, cell fragment from those proplatelet extensions. And those are the actual platelets, those little cell fragments. So your megakaryocytes actually last for quite a long time while they continue to put out these little extensions that that the blood flow slices off into platelets. Okay, so that concludes my lecture on hemopoiesis. Uh, if you think you learned something, leave me a like, leave me a comment in the comments below, uh, and stay tuned for the second half of blood physiology, hemostasis.